All right, good afternoon and welcome to seminar seven of year two of our Maximus seminar. We are within volume one of the Ambigua still. We are working in Ambiguum 10 within volume one, this great long work. And we're looking at roughly uh, pages 267 to 309, roughly, those 20 pages um, in there. Now, <clears throat> themes uh, for today, I, I want to look at eight different passages and read through them and then ponder them a little bit, and then we'll, we'll pause and consider together. Overall themes, we still have the idea of being, being is and is more, that something is and is more. That is very much present in, in here, uh, figured in the symbol in part. There is also the, the theme of particular approximation, particular ways of drawing near, approximating, um, whether roughly uh, outlining or, or, or gesturing towards, or approximating as in drawing near. And this approximation or drawing near has to do with the simple and the holy. The simple is another prominent uh, theme uh, in these pages. The simple and the holy, or the simple holy, even. Now, just to, just to uh, re reiterate a few things that were discussed last time, the transfiguration, which is where our passage today begins, the transfiguration is a kind of guiding event for this whole ambiguum. It's the Maximus returns to it more than once and meditates on it, contemplates it more than once. It's 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 the key or the or the or the clue or the 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 the, the, the clearing through which we can see what else he's talking about. Last time we 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 spoke about the fact that one is both one's own and God's own one's own and God's own, that are innermost essences of God. And synergy means that one resonates. This word resonate came up last time, a musical term, which is very good. One resonates with Christ. One resonates beyond oneself. One resonates beyond oneself. One is and is more. <coughs> but one resonates in response to Christ. And our natural our natural responsiveness to creation, to the moving energy of our logos, our natural responsiveness is symbolic thinking and making, symbolic thinking and making. Or to put it a little bit differently, we've been, we've been defining, not defining, but discussing the ethos of, of the Christian, the Christian ethos, personhood, Christian personhood in terms of response, in terms of forgiveness. This was a, an insight that Goa had many sessions ago, and we've been playing it out. With our stance of response, then, when we respond to something, our energy is to complete it, to partake of, and to try to make whole the event. In the same way, a symbol completes reality. It integrates, it draws together and into comprehensible form, reality. It offers us a way in. All right, so that, those were ideas that came up in the discussion uh, last time that I wanted to, um, to, to reiterate. They're, they're, they're our ideas, they're not my ideas, but, but, um, but I think that they, they pertain here. Now, if we'll turn to 267, please. I wanna read, this is one of the, there are three slightly longer passages and two uh, and, and, and the rest are, are shorter. But this passage 267, it begins at, at section 31b. And this is about the transfiguration. At the risk of appearing overly inquisitive about these matters, there is, as it seems to me, another mystery revealed to us in the divine transfiguration, great and divine and more luminous than, than what has been mentioned so far, more luminous than what has been mentioned so far. He sets it up carefully, but also auspiciously. 
I think that the dramatic events, so befitting of God, which took place on the mountain during the transfiguration, secretly, in a hidden way, indicate the two general modes of theology. Okay, so let's, let, we're going to close read to the, the two general, there are two, not two of, but the two. So there are, there are complementary ways, these ways complement each other. And they're also general. They're general in the sense that they're not specialized. All right. The first is simple, as that word, and uncaused, and verily affirms the divine solely through a complete denial, properly honoring divine transcendence by absolute silence. The second, that's apophasis. We're going to return to this because this language here is very, very important. <coughs> Pardon me. The second is composite and magnificently describes the divine by means of positive affirmations based on its effects. With these and within the limits of human understanding, the exalted knowledge of God and divine realities leads us through symbols appropriate for us, through symbols appropriate, not all symbols are appropriate and not all symbols are appropriate for us, through symbols appropriate for us to these two ways of theology. He calls them ways here and earlier they're modes. So we understand that a method is a path. Through reverent understanding, reverence is always Maximus' highest mode of knowing. Reverent understanding of created beings, this knowledge places before us the inner principles of both, teaching us that everything that transcends the senses is a symbol of the first way, apophasis, whereas the symbol of the second is the sum of all the magnificent objects of sense perception. Okay. So we're led into understanding apophasis and cataphasis by symbols. For it is only through the symbols that are beyond the senses. That's an odd idea. So symbol is actually noetic. It's not just an aesthetic thing. Through symbols that are beyond the senses, sorry, pardon me, for it is only through symbols that are beyond the senses that we believe in the truth that exists beyond reason and intellect. Through symbols that are beyond the senses, <laughs> beyond our aesthetic sense, that we believe, this word is a, a hinge word, but it's going to be a mystery. In the truth, the aletheia that exists beyond logos and nous, beyond logos and nous, truth that exists, exists beyond logos and nous. Yet what this truth is in itself, what it is in itself, and how, and of what kind, and when and whence it might be, we do not dare to probe into, nor do we even so much as tolerate the formation of an intellectual conception concerning it, declining to involve, involve ourselves in any act of, any such act of irreverence. Instead, from the symbols that fall within the range of our senses, our mind takes to the extent possible for us, and only roughly at that, approximation, only roughly at that, the likenesses of the knowledge of God, and we say that he is all things insofar as we have come to know him from his creations as their cause. Continuing, let us now consider how appropriately and wisely the symbol of each of these two modes of theology is present in the divine transfiguration of the Lord. For in... <clears throat> For in his measureless love for mankind, there was need for him to be created in human form without undergoing any change, and to become a type and symbol of himself, presenting himself symbolically by means of his own self, and through the manifestation of himself, to lead all creation to himself, although he is hidden and totally beyond all manifestation and to provide human beings in a human loving fashion as with the visible divine actions of his flesh as signs of his invisible infinity, which is totally transcendent and secretly hidden, 
which no being in any in absolutely any way whatsoever can capture in thoughts or language. Continuing. <laughs> Thus the lights of the Lord's face, which overcame the activity of human sense perception, formed within the blessed apostles the negative mode of mystical theology. Again, it's just the mystical apophatic the theology. According to which the blessed and holy Godhead, according to its essence, is beyond ineffability and unknowability, for it infinitely transcends all infinity. To the beings which exist after it, the Godhead does not leave behind even the slightest trace of itself that can be apprehended by them, giving up to none of them anything of itself that could be used to form a concept about how or to what extent, it is at once a monad and a trinity, since by its nature, the uncreated cannot be contained in any created thing, nor can the unlimited be circumscribed as an object of thought by, me, by things that are limited. Much of that so far is about apophasis. And then the same light also formed within the apostles, the affirmative mode of theology, cataphasis, which is divided into modes concerned with activity, providence, and judgment. The mode concerned with activity is grounded in the beauty and magnificence of creation and indicates that God is the creator of everything, which is evident in the brightly shining garments of the Lord, which our discourse has already established as signifying the visible objects of creation. All right. So I want to just touch on three things here on um, the, uh, the transfiguration itself, and then on these two modes of theology and symbol and reverence and apophasis and then beauty. The transfiguration, it, it seems to be our, our tradition's finest eschatological event. For we see the fullness of divinity and the fullness of creation as one as one, in one mode or one tropos, in one person. That's first. The second, the event of truth, which the, the transfiguration as the event of truth, is integral, integral, which means there's a place and a portion for each and all. It doesn't lose anything by participation or by partaking of it. It's integral. In other words, the transfiguration for us is and is more. It is what it is, and it is more. <clears throat> and it's completed, as it were, in our, our own response, in how we respond, how we move in response. In other words, in our caring company with others, in which we treat them as the light of Christ shines through them. That's the completion of the transfiguration. That's the first idea. The second, regarding these two modes of theology. So there are two modes and they're general. So the path becomes one of emphasis, emphasis. One is not better. One is emphasized at a certain point or not due to how appropriate it is to draw forth the word of life through that method. We have to be careful that we don't make an idol of our method, especially since our methods can be quite um, wonderful. Truth is present in the eschatological events. Beyond that, definition is problematic. This is the bottom of 267 <laughs> or to 26. Nine, Maximus says, both symbols of theology give us the truth of the events, right? Particularly apophasis. But to ask what that truth is, to try to formulate it, to define it, is, in Maximus's term, an act of irreverence. We note the blending, the blending, the merging, the non-separation of, of the thinking and the willing and the caring. And then we also have the unfathomable mystery of divine existence. We said the word is exist is used, existence is used. 
But all else is shunned. God is sheer, remember. <coughs> and then the very fact that the, that the transfiguration of our incarnate logos shows us these two paths means that our emphasis, our method, our, our path is always through the incarnate logos, always through incarnation. And then also in the bottom, symbol and symbol and, and reverence. At the bottom of 267, Maximus plays with symbol and, and he points it to it as a means, this means of, 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 well, believing in the truth that exists beyond reason and intellect. A symbol draws us into the completion of presence, right? To the event of truth is the place of presence. A symbol draws us into the completion of presence. It doesn't formulate that presence, right? A symbol is movement, it's completion. It's push, pulling to casting together, right? Rendering something complete. And then apophasis. Maximus says two very curious things here. One, uh, the first is midway through six, 267, and the second is on 271. And I want to reread these because th they point to, to something curious that, that, that we need to note in the text. So this is 267. Two, Maximus says two general modes of theology. The first is simple and uncaused. And verily affirms, okay, so it's affirmative, finally, essentially affirmative, the divine, all right, solely through a complete denial, okay, that's, that's apophasis, translated as complete denial, so leave that aside, properly honoring divine transcendence by absolute silence, properly honoring divine transcendence by absolute silence. Now, if we uh, turn back to 217 for one minute, please. 217. This is a passage on Melchizedek. When Maximus, remember the terms he used for Melchizedek are extraordinarily exalted. And we, we, we bow before that mystery. We don't comprehend it, but we still try to make sense. But halfway through 217, uh, about some eight lines up from the end of the first paragraph. So the, the about halfway through. It's right after a dash. He said, these I say, he's talking about, uh, pardon me, um, saints. These we should not characterize by the property of the things they have abandoned, but rather to name them from the magnificence of what they have assumed, for which and in which alone, henceforth, they exist and are known. So Maximus is pointing to a way of talking about the sacred or the holy that, that calls to it, names it by its height, by its purity, by its completion, by its fullness, without indicating the path to that fullness, but most importantly, without denying the path to that fullness, because apophasis means the path to that fullness. Right? So honoring by absolute silence, but apophasis is completed in silence. Silence completes it. Now over to, to um, 271. 271. Uh, just three lines down, formed within the blessed apostles, the negative mode of mystical theology. Okay, so it forms within them the negative mode. So apophasis is a mode that's formed within us. It's not, you know, a, a, a series of syllogisms or concepts that we that we know. It's a, it's a way of thinking. According to which the blessed and holy Godhead, according to its essence, is beyond ineffability and unknowability, for it infinitely transcends all infinity. Beyond ineffability and unknowability. That takes us beyond the is and is not into the is and is more. The language of is and is not positive and negative. Theology is not appropriate. It is and is more first. Um, 
and then and then continuing to the beings which exist after it the godhead does not but leave behind even the slightest trace of itself that, that can be apprehended by them giving up to none of them anything of itself that could be used to form a concept about how or to what extent it is at once a monad and a trinity and so on now this is speaking of the essence of god so to speak right it's speaking of the highest measure, the highest figuration we have. It's not indicating the rest of what goes into that, first of all. Right? In other words, it's not denying the incarnation, but it's not mentioning it either. But we know the incarnation is part of this, part of this sense. And it does not leave behind even the slightest trace of itself. But we've also read throughout Maximus that all of being and creation is, is inwardly formed by the Logoi of God. We are made in the image of God. And yet this is true. Maximus is speaking a truth here. So what do we see? Again, we see an emphasis. And we see this, the, the, the phrasing is at the level of completion. Uh, that, that's a strange thought. But this, the phrasing, is, it's not describing the process of completion. It's not symbolic. The phrasing is assuming assuming remember assumed and thus become the only reality a level of completion okay let's move on um just the final the final passage cataphatic theology is based in beauty based in the aesthetic based in our delight with the world with the world and it shows god as the maker god as the poet of all god as our as our as our uh, as the phraser of our beings the beauty and magnificence of creation that's where we look to for everything that's not apophatic the rest of it we can see in beauty okay and then over to 273 this is the bottom of 273 and over to 275 and here it, it's about the, the divine economia and the transfiguration of creation. From having conversed, this is bottom of 273, from having conversed with the Lord and having spoken about his departure, which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem, Moses and Elijah not only learned of the fulfillment of the mysteries concerning his departure, which were proclaimed in advance through the law and the prophets, but equally that the fulfillment of God's ineffable plan for the universe contained within his divine dispensations was completely beyond the comprehension of beings. All that could be known was his providence and judgment through which the universe is led in an orderly manner to an end known in advance only to God. No one else knew what it would be or how it would take place, or what form it would take, or when it would occur. The only ones who, in truth, knew simply that it would take place were the saints. They knew it would, but their knowledge was approximate. Who purified their souls by means of the virtues, and who tilted the whole balance of their intellective power, their noetic dynamis, to divine things, and thus they heard, if I may put it this way, the universal nature of visible beings. They heard the universal nature of visible beings through the modes by which they are naturally constituted, all but explicitly proclaiming the end of this present harmonious order. Okay. Just a couple of notes here. So this is about the divine economia first, not the divine essence. Um, but even the divine economia is beyond our apprehension, right? Sometimes we think that the economy of God is what we can comprehend and the essence of God is what we can't. But Maximus is saying the fullness and the fulfillment, the completion of the divine economia, of which the incarnation is part, is beyond our comprehension. He also seems to indicate that the the form of the universe, the form of the universe 
grants comprehension. The form of the universe grants comprehension. And by that, I mean that because the, because the saints, because the universe is beyond our comprehension, we cannot discern its form either. Aesthetically and noetically, it's beyond our comprehension. The completion of all form, which is eschatology, is known in advance only to God, right? That's what the text is, known in advance only to God, the completion of form, the eschatological completion of form. So to comprehend the form of the universe would be to see its completion, and that's beyond us. The saints, he says, are silent. There's no defining, but there is, they knew simply that it would take place. And then they heard. They heard in the completion of visible creation. They heard the completion of noetic creation too, the fulfillment of God's economy, which is what Maximus says. He could, they, they, they sensed could not define. Okay. And then over to 279. 279. This is just, um, just the first six, seven lines here. 279. There's just a couple of things to say here. Maximus writes, top of 279. In passing from visible things to what is beyond them, the saints brilliantly foresaw the end of all things. Uh, that's uh, following up from the last thing we read. They foresaw the end of all things. In passing from visible things to what is beyond them, the saints brilliantly foresaw the end of all things, which is bound to come at some point in the future. Maximus is approximate. This is not something that he can speak with surety about, bound to come at some point in the future, ushering in a condition in which no beings will move or be moved, for there will be no movement at all, but rather an ineffable stillness that will contain the flow and motion of whatever is carried along and moved. What do we see here? Maximus is unsure of timing. He's unsure of mortal time. But he speaks sure-footedly about the, um, the uh, let's say, the logos of time, movement beyond time. Passing from visible things to what is beyond them, we see that something happens either side of a line. Something happens either side of a line. Presence always includes something more, something, something else, something more. One thing is never one thing by the fact of being distinct. All right. And then passing beyond, passing beyond, right? Passing from visible things to what is beyond. This passing beyond is apophasis. And it grants us the completion of the thing. In passing beyond the visible to what is beyond, the saints first saw the end. In the passing beyond apophasis, the movement of apophasis grants us completion of things or the knowledge of the completion of things in other words all lines imply horizons all lines imply horizons and he says that there will be no movement at all no movement at all in the culmination of creation there'll be no movement at all but ineffable still an ineffable stillness <clears throat> there is flow in motion but it is somehow sustained within or enveloped by, or embraced by an ineffable stillness, a stillness which speaks of seeking being over. We don't understand that because that's not our tropos. We don't, we're, we're built, our energy is to seek, but we're told that this happens. Right. And then over to 285. 285. This is the bottom of 285, um, just over to the top of 287. <clears throat> 
Maximus says, for who in contemplating the beauty and the magnificence of creation, remember that's the province of cataphatic thinking of affirmative theology, who in contemplating the beauty and the magnificence of creation does not immediately understand that God is the one who has brought all creatures into existence since he is the origin and cause and creator of all beings. And would not such a person's thoughts subsequently ascend to God alone, leaving all these things below, since nothing is by nature capable of containing the full extent of the intellect's passage, leaving all these things below in his desire to grasp immediately the one whom he has come to know through the medium of his works. First, beauty implies or is informed by a maker, right? The maid is informed by beauty, impels us towards its source, the font of it, the font of its beauty, the font of its life, of, of its energy. We know, though, that the movement from creation to creator is it's the most beautiful, but it's also the most fraught. It's the path where idolatry intrudes, the movement from creation to creator. And so we have to treat beauty joyfully, but with care. That's the first. Second, and then this, this, and would not such a person's thoughts subsequently ascend to God alone, leaving all these things below, since nothing is by nature capable of containing the full extent of the intellect's passage. The intellect's passage here is essentially theosis. That movement that he's describing is essentially theosis. And he says, nothing is by nature capable of containing the full extent of the intellect's passage. No, that's why theosis is synergistic. Right? But this passage, as in theosis, is not a negation or a discarding of things. It's just leaving, leaving the things below. It's moving, passing through. And the, the, the energy, the beauty of that passing through is, is, is a vital, strong energy. It's stronger than what it leaves behind. For it's seeking the eternal font of life. Right. And then the last two lines, in his desire to grasp immediately the one whom he has come to know through the medium of his works. This is about desire and icon. Our desire for the one who is proceeds through his image, through his icon, through the person who is the image of Christ, through the creation, which is an image of, of the divinity. We love the icon and our regard passes on to its prototype. That's a phrase uh, in our tradition that bounces around. I believe it's Saint, Saint Basil the Great. But our regard for the icon passes to its prototype, but we still love the icon. We still love the person. And this desire is structural for our, for our being. So being is being unto, being unto, or as we said at the beginning and last time, one's own is also his own one's own and is his own right? and because the being of god's own is loving our own is also loving right. um. And then turn to the to the, the bottom of 293, 293. This is just a, another short passage, but it's important about existence and beyond. Bottom of 293, over, <clears throat> over to 295. This will also demonstrate I was talking about the, um, the where and the when, which inevitably attend incarnate Genesis. 
that an incarnate being is always where and when. And he doesn't mean them in a Kantian abstract mental coordinate sense. He means it like Bakhtin means it when he talks about chronotope, the placidness, the locatedness. So he's really saying, talking about the locational elements of our incarnate being. This will also demonstrate that beings are subject to the category of when as completely existing in time, since no being after God exists simply, but in a certain way. No being after God exists simply, but in a certain way. And for this reason, beings are not without a beginning. For anything that in any way admits of the principle of a how, right? At one point did not exist, even if now it does. Thus, when we say the divine exists, we do not say it exists in a certain way. And for this reason, we say of God that he is and was in a simple, infinite, and absolute sense. For the divine is beyond closure in language or thought, which is why when we say that the divine exists, we do not predicate of it the Pardon me, we do not predicate of it the category of being. For though being is derived from God, God himself is not being as such. For God is beyond being, whether one speaks or thinks in terms of the how of a being or of being in a simple, unqualified sense. And if beings have existence, not simply, but in a way qualified by a how, then it has to be granted that just as they exist subject to a where, on account of the position and definiteness of their natural principles, so they are completely subject to a when, on account of their having a beginning. That was wonderful. Too bad 20th century didn't, didn't have that passage before it started. Now, God exists. God exists. Just before this, he's talked about the universe, the pan, the all which he says is conditioned to by a where and a when. But he says at the bottom of 293, no being after God exists simply, but in a certain way. And he also tells us that God's existence means God exists beyond all horizon and category. There's no horizon and no category which can possibly name, call, phrase, God. But this means, too, that the language of being here, the language of being is under the authority, is governed by simplicity. Simplicity is the, the governing word here. So when we see simple and being in a sentence, the simple takes is emphasized, takes precedence over the being, which is why we can, it's wonderful how Maximus recuperates this, why we can say God is and was. We say it in a simple way. And simple means beyond relation, beyond condition, beyond need, beyond, beyond any complement qualification, beyond any distinction possible. Is and was become icons for us of how the ontology, how ontology exists in the age to come. Just like time, the principles of time are cleansed in the age to come, the principles of being are, are refined in the age to come. This gives us an icon of that, I think. And then God beyond, God beyond, God is beyond being. We can apprehend this apophatically, but that's all. We cannot describe the completion, to, to describe the completion of God, the completion of the apophatic event would be to talk simply, and we, and we don't do that. The divine is beyond closure in language or thought. And Jennings, you mentioned Burke earlier. We miss Michael right now. Michael is making this point wonderfully, that it's not language or thought which denigrate the divine. It's the idea of closure. And Maximus is very clear, beyond closure. But this also means beyond our completion, beyond our completion. So what does this mean? We don't complete, we, we cannot close. We can articulate 
we can say, we can chant, we can phrase divine being apophatically, but we can't do it with any certainty or with any finality or with any insistence or with any arrogance. Reverence, again, to return to reverence and a deep silence sounding within our language. Okay. Let's, <clears throat> there are other things to say and to know, but let's, let's go to the last passage, which I, which I would like to look at. It's on page 305, please. It's the, the last major passage. The others that, that we have in mind are, are complementary. We can return to them. 305 uh, to 309. Just the bottom of 305, the five lines up. over to the end of, of 309, or, or the end of the section on 309. Um, do you feel like doing a little bit of reading? Would you mind reading this passage, my friend? And then um, just to hear a different voice, and I'll make a few comments, but then we'll, we'll use this to open up our, our, our conversation together. So it begins yet in saying, you see that? And then it's yes. over to the end of the uh, end of the, if, if you don't mind, please. Definitely, all right. Yet in saying this, we do not thereby signify the blessed Godhead itself in its own existence, which is infinitely unapproachable and absolutely inaccessible to every principle, mode, intellect, and to all language and every name. But based on our faith in the Godhead, we furnish ourselves with a definition of it, which is accessible to us and within our reach. For sacred discourse does not in any way speak of this, I mean the name of monad, as representative of the divine and blessed essence, but rather as indicative of its utter simplicity, which is beyond every quantity, quality, and relation, lest we think that it is some whole composed of certain parts or a part of some whole. For the Godhead is above and beyond all division, addition and every part and whole, since it is devoid of quantity and all existence according to place and every concept that defines it in terms of how it exists, since it is devoid of qualities. And it is free and independent of all conjunction and proximity to anything else, for it transcends relatedness and has nothing anterior or present with or subsequent to itself, for it is beyond everything and is not ranked together with any being according to any principle or mode whatsoever. And this is perhaps what the great and divine Dionysius was thinking of when he said, for this reason, even though the Godhead that transcends all things is hymned as monad and trinity, it is neither monad nor trinity as understood by us or any other thing. But so that we might truly hymn its transcendent unity and divine fecundity, we have given the divine name of Trinity and unity to that which is beyond all names, and the names of beings to that which is beyond all being. Thus, in no way can anyone who wishes to live piously in the truth say that a dyad is a multitude without beginning or the beginning of something in general. For it will be evident to him by virtue of his intellectual contemplation and comprehension that there is only one God who is beyond all infinity and who cannot be known in any way whatsoever by any beings except through faith. Yet even this knowledge, which is derived from God's creation, reveals to us the fact that God exists, but not what he is and that he is the creator and fashioner of every age and time along with everything that exists in them. 
yet he will not conclude from this that any of these things has in any way existed together with God from eternity. For he knows that it is impossible for either of two eternally coexisting principles to be the cause of the other. Such a notion is logically invalid and inadmissible, and it would be rather ridiculous for anyone with intelligence in these matters to make one of two identically existing beings the cause of the other. It must be accepted that the eternally existing God has created all things out of nothing, not partially and incompletely, but completely and wholly, for they have been brought into being with great wisdom by an infinitely intelligent and infinitely powerful cause in which all things are efficiently held together, guarded and governed in an all-powerful foundation, and to which all things are turned as to their own proper end, as the great Dionysius, the Areopagite, has said somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> said somewhere <laughs> a, a, a few thoughts but let's meditate on this let's begin to meditate so let my thoughts just lead into our general it seems to me that th this is in the middle of a general meditation on on the idea of monad and dyad the one and the and the and the more than one which are greek philosophical forms maximus says that our faith can open our eyes to the divine mystery revealed through the intimacies of form, even on this basic level, that the intimacies of form, playing with form and relation, can open up the, the divine mystery. But one adores and desires to draw near, but not to comprehend. Right? So, our faith is a being unto the divine, not an attempt to formulate or ascertain or capture or, or contain, to use language from earlier. God is transcendent, not, not, not in terms of is and is not, but in terms of is and is more. And we read here of the utter simplicity the utter simplicity of the divine and blessed essence, the utter simplicity. There's nothing to discern, nothing to distinguish, nothing for our minds. There's no grasp, as Maximus says. It's sheer. And he says the utter simplicity of the divine and blessed essence, before he goes on to muse about what we know of God, he mentions the divine and blessed essence. This checks our arrogance our spiritual hastening he's saying prepare to receive don't grasp something beyond yourself receive what will be given to you and so our faith then our faith this idea of faith or belief becomes more a receptiveness to the call to the divine call right so faith is not foregoing one's logos one's reason or one's noose, one's mind, or one's freedom. It's receptiveness to the call, the call from beyond. And Maximus says, the divine transcends relatedness, transcends, it's not ranked, ranked together with anything. Our ideas of hierarchy, our ideas of this according to this, are not appropriate to God. There's no hierarchy appropriate to God. We don't know how to measure the divine because it calls to us from far beyond our ken, far beyond our knowing, but yet it calls to us from within our hearts. This is why it's a mystery. And we're reminded that all, Maximus says this again and again, all revelation is also a reservation. All showing forth is also a holding back. But what we're shown forth, what we're given, is the gift of communion. And so our faith also means a being at ease in communion, in creation, to be full of joy and encounter, 
and to respond lovingly, right? To be delighted with life. This is part of faith too. This is our response to the gift of life. And our response is who we are and it forms who we are. Uh, those are my thoughts anyways, but this is a, this is a, this is a, a extraordinarily rich, rich passage that you just read. Did anything echo in your mind while you were while you were reading it on it, or are, are you percolating? Or uh, Goa, what what have you thought about about um, about this last section here? Lorraine Jennings, what do we think? Or circling back, or circling back. Maximus talks about the fact that God exists, but not what He is. This is one of the deep, enduring insights or truths of our tradition. That, but not what. And that he exists is discerned through the how. This is how Yanaras describes it. And we learn from how God exists, how we exist, which gives us our being as communion. So the that's not what the, these are. I mean, it's 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 kind of like the where and the when. It sounds almost uh, cursory, but they're 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 pillars here. Well, I'll jump in. Um, not on that particular, although I think it precedes it. Um, the the <clears throat> early on in your your. Uh, emphasizing the various points, Andrew, you came across a passage that I really um, was quite, uh, I don't know what it is that I, I, that I was struggling with exactly, but the, the, the statement that, uh, that the Godhead doesn't leave behind even the slightest trace um, of who the Godhead is, that's page yet, 271. Yeah, there it is, right there, 271, yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in you know, I, I've got a lot of scribbling right there in the side. It's like creation, question mark, imago dei, question mark, scripture, question mark. Does, is there even a concept of the Godhead leaving behind, question mark? You know, what about the role of the Holy Spirit? So um, I do understand the, well, no, if I understood it, then I would deny it. But I, I under I get the point about the ultimate unknowability of God. That God is without quantity, is without quality, and so and with a finite mind, there's no way I can ever approach that which is infinitely beyond infinite. So I get all of that. That said. Has God not left us something? I mean, far from, you know, not even uh, the slightest trace, God has left scripture that, you know, in most creeds, we say does reflect who our God is. Um, in creation, Maximus himself is talking about the saints. And from that, they were able to infer the qualities of God. Um, and so to say not slightest trace, but yet the saints, even pre-incarnation saints, the prophets, etc., were able to infer from creation who God was. The, the, those who spoke of the law were, were able to infer the grace that would come later. Um, so anyway, I, I, I would like to probe that because if uh, because I think it gets to your last point about just the inability to access to to understand it all. Well, you know, you I mean, each thing you just said, Maximus knows, too. And, you know, Maximus knows. <laughs> and he knows too. it a lot better. So than why I do. Is he, no, I don't yeah. mean like that. So yeah. why do you think he's saying that here? Why is he? Why is he speaking in this language? Well, if he was speaking in, I, I mean, there are lots of religious writers who write in hyperbole 
to take it to a very far end so that we can, you know, really disorientate ourselves uh, and shake us loose of our assumptions. I got to say, that hasn't been my experience with hmm. Maximus. That's because not him. Okay. He He's very careful. Um, and so... I completely understand if there, if he said there's nothing where you can comprehend, that is have a comprehensive understanding. I get it, but apprehend, not even a slightest trace. I I'm, I'm flummoxed by it. So I, I turn it over to others um, because I think, you know, when in faith, who I believe in God, I don't just believe in the existence of God. I believe that the God is love. I believe that the God is good. I believe that the God actually cares about me personally. I think that the God wishes the very best of all creation. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things I believe about God that I think is rooted in scripture, which is rooted in who God is and who is not how other religions view God. Some, some other religions don't view God. So how do I deal with the not a slightest trace of knowledge? David. So yes, let's turn to David. <laughs> well, when, when even with three even with three days even with three days of cold, we know that Doctor Go will give us a, some sort of cogent line to be able to figure this out because I sure couldn't today. I meant it less dramatically than that, but oh, okay. <laughs> David, please. <laughs> <clears throat> well, a couple thoughts, David. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying there because it is um it's a it seems like a pretty dramatic thing to say. One is that um this is in the context of the transfiguration. Right. Yeah. And his beloved disciples were there. They witnessed it. It left a trace on them. But when the jig was up, they abandoned him. So traces aren't good enough. Yeah. I mean, it's not that they aren't, it's not even that they aren't real. It's not that they aren't useful it's not that these aren't things to be thought about and i mean his he's working with this all the time but i think in this passage what what he's saying is um in the end it's not about the revelation in the end, it's not about the traces. It's not about the law. In the end, it's about um, in drawing near to God, in, in the presence of. And around that, we don't have any words. So my, my, my sense is that he's... You know, there is so much mischief made around God. You know, I love Alfred North Whitehead's lovely comment about um, how <clears throat> most of the mischief in the world is made by those wishing to pay God metaphysical compliments. <laughs> and I think Maximus is, you know, he's living at a time when lots of that is going on. I mean, that's that's what was going on with all of the debates around the councils. They were they were trying to preserve one or another idea of God. And again, it's not that those ideas aren't of significance, even the ones that aren't real, even the ones that are false. <clears throat> but I think he's here trying to. Um, say
the saints are silent because there's nothing to say when you are in the presence of communion. Um, so, like so much of his writing and so much other theological writing or, or scripture itself, it's always dangerous to take a piece and try and build a theological <clears throat> system on it. <clears throat> it would be true with this too. Uh, but that doesn't mean it isn't, it isn't inviting us to remember, just remember that um, you may have the most perfect concept. Or I'll put it a different way. I would suggest that Satan has the most perfect concept. <laughs> oh, you're so delightfully provocative. <laughs> That's great. And um and of course. As Origen has made clear, in the end, Satan will give up that idea and come home. Yeah. And so it is not, it's not about the, the knowability or the apprehension of God. Yeah. It is the relationship. The relationship. With God, yeah. Another another thought, David. And as um, Andrew had talked about this, this uh, was talking about it. It occurred to me. You know, in the Hebrew Bible, the name of God that the Jews have in the Bible, the name that isn't a name, right? Um. The name that is never said. Um, they always say Adonai instead of saying the name. Saying the name has become quite popular in Catholic churches, and I think in some Protestant churches in the in the last fifty years, they got kind of delighted to say the name in churches because they thought they were being fond of Jews. <laughs> I thought, what? What are you talking about? Jews would never say this. Why are you doing this? <laughs> but that that as as I'm sure you know is a combination of of um forms of a verb. Yeah. It's, which is put together. That's why it's not a name. It's just the acronym, if that's the right term to use here, for was, is, and will shall. be. Yeah. And it's called being because of the nature of human language. But I think if we look at Jewish ritual, we see it more precisely, its presence. You know, that's mm -hmm. why the only time that name is uttered by the high priest on the high holy day, on the day of atonement, is in the Holy of Holies, in that empty space, which is understood to be the place of presence. <clears throat> and of course, the place of presence is everywhere, but we need to, to use Maximus' term, we need to have a symbol of it yeah. so that we can be awake to it when we see it in our daily life. Is that mm. what do you? Oh that, boy, that's rich. Is that still? Yeah. I'm glad you spoke about it because I I think it's it's so um, it is stark yeah. when we think that he was involved in all these tangles. Um, yeah, and had his 
tongue cut out and hand cut off and everything else because of those tangles and yet was not wanting to say my side wins or yeah. this is it. He's willing to live with that ultimate unknowability. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. I was wondering, Ahmed, uh, you know, I have a colleague in Turkey that I've thought a little bit about this with, but not not a lot. Have you have you thought much about and I don't want to lead this astray if it if it goes astray, but it did occur to me. You know, there's a transfiguration account, of course, in the in the Quran with the Prophet Muhammad going to the Dome of the Rock yeah. and ascending and being with um, with the prophets. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but I was wondering if there were echoes here or there were things that were bubbling around in your mind related to that because of that text. And I haven't had a chance to sit and read that text in the Quran, but I will do it. Um, right now I am fully immersed in Maximus <laughs> and in, and in this moment with you guys and Maximus, um, I will say I wanted to respond to something. Uh, by the way, that that account is uh, it's called the Lisra wal Maraj. So uh, when Prophet Muhammad travels up into the heavens, mm -hmm. and like you said, he meets with the Prophet Jesus. And with uh, and there's a it's interesting about that. There's always an Islam, I'm you know, uh, a great glorification of Jesus. He's usually actually elevated beyond all the other prophets and and Mary as well. In fact, Mary, I would say in the Quran is even more venerated than Jesus himself. This is always, as I read Maximus now more and I have come across the idea of the Theotokos, mm -hmm. Mary as a Theot I'm, I'm, it's it's fascinating to me. It's making me rethink some things from my own tradition. Um, but coming back to something that David Jennings said earlier, <laughs> this is maybe David Jennings, uh, by response to what your first comment, which is when I read Maximus, I'm always, I feel, and I'm, uh, I'm outside the tradition, um, but I always feel like I'm being called towards a mystery. There, there, there's nothing... Yeah. There's nothing rhetorical. To use your word, I never feel like I'm being called to infer anything. Yeah. Even the word infer to me is suggests a departure from this simple knowing. This thing and Andrew elaborated on this beautifully today. This idea of simplicity and knowing simply. How does one know simply what is what is beyond every quantity quality relation? Well, what does that mean exactly? And and for me, that is the essence. What does that mean? And how how does one walk through that and into that and with that? And uh, Andrew also read that great passage about uh, how beings that come after the Godhead can know nothing of him and can never apprehend him. The word apprehension has come up, has come up like we've talked about. It. I think you mentioned also, David, what does it mean we can't comprehend or can't apprehend? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, there's, it's a great, it's a great mystery, but it's a mystery to me that points towards hope. It, there's such hopefulness. Yeah. There's, there's such, um, Yeah, as Andrew said, I'm still percolating. So, as always, with Maximus, I will. Alma, oh, just just one second though. Pursue that idea of hope because this is the second time you've you've you've. I mean, I just even Andrew. vaguely, but even <laughs> even vaguely, this is the second time you've brought it up as an effect. What does that mean to hope? Do you mean that he he seems to be opening? Is he is he giving sustenance? Which 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 is 
I mean, you said he's not rhetorical, so we get the sense, I mean, we all feel this, but you put it so nicely, we get the sense he's not leading us by the nose, as Dostoevsky would say, right? Mm. He's not feeding us a line. He, he's there. He's there. He's there. Th that's right? exactly it. That's exactly it. When I read Maximus, I feel I'm in a house of the spirit. I don't feel like I'm being led and not being told something. Even his use of language is, is yeah. profound. It's, it's, the more I read him, we're now, you know, 150 pages or so in, it's just a house. It's growing. The, it's the spirit that's growing when, you know, it's, uh, when I read Aristotle or the ancient Greeks or philosophy in general, there's a sense in which they are fundamentally rhetorical. They are fundamentally trying to lead you or give you a set, just lead you. <clears throat> but Maximus is never the case. And I feel when he talks about the saints and the, sim and the simplicity of knowing that mode of knowing, it's what he's gesturing towards. It's what I think, uh, I hesitate to venture uh, the word symbol You've talked about the word symbol many times and and we've talked about it a couple of times today symbol to me his conception of symbol seems to me and you mentioned this, it seems gestural it just it it helps us draw near it is never constitutive of of the present or it it just it helps it aids us to draw near it's all about the drawing near i think david goa mentioned this a little bit earlier it's the drawing near that matters. Um, <clears throat> could, and I will stop. I, I, I don't want to go. I mean, I'm happy to go where you want to go, Andrew, unless. No, no, please, please. No, well, that's, be that's gonna... beautiful, Ahmed. That, that's all I was going to say. I mean, yeah. that, that speaks to that's. I sense something like that was behind that word hope, and, but that's really, that's well put. That's well put. Pardon me, pardon me, David. Go up. Pardon me. That passage, that last passage in Maximus, it just, I mean, I am certain that W.H. Auden was meditating on that <laughs> when he wrote yeah. his meditations on Simeon in uh, for the wow. time being. Can I read you a, a portion of that? Yeah, yeah is a kind of response to it do so. Do so. so this is um this is a um an oratorio a red play yep. that auden did in 1940 as the war broke out i think it is the finest meditation on the meaning of the incarnation written in the 20th century so there are many parts in it. It's quite burlesque. But this is a tour, getting on towards the end of it. It's called the Meditation of Simeon. Simeon is, of course, the, the righteous rabbi that recognizes Jesus Christ on the stairs of the temple. And let me read a little bit of it because I think it. It's another way of touching on what I think Maximus is trying to in finest words here. <clears throat> so this is Simeon. Before the unconditional could manifest itself under the conditions of existence, it was necessary that man should first have reached the ultimate frontier of consciousness the secular limit of memory beyond which there remained but one thing for him to know his original sin but of this it is impossible for him to become conscious because it is in itself what conditions his will to knowledge for as long as he was in paradise, he could not sin by any conscious intention or act. His as yet unfallen will could not rebel against the truth, 
could only rebel against the truth by taking flight into an unconscious lie. He could only eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil by forgetting that its existence was a fiction of the evil one, that there is only the tree of life. <clears throat> There's a chorus and the chorus says, the bravest drew back on the brink of the abyss. And then Simeon again, and this is what was so striking to me. <clears throat> From the beginning, and in response also to David's um, probing of this. From the beginning until now, God spoke through his prophets. The word aroused the uncomprehending depths of their flesh to a witnessing fury. And their witness was this, that the word should be made flesh. Hmm. Yet their witness could only be received as long as it was vaguely misunderstood, as long as it seemed either to be neither impossible nor necessary, or necessary but not impossible, or possible or impossible, but not necessary. Let me give them to you again. Yet their witness could only be received as long as it was vaguely misunderstood, as long as it seemed either to be neither impossible nor necessary, or necessary, but not impossible or impossible, but not necessary. And the prophet could not, and the prophecy could therefore not be fulfilled. For it could only be fulfilled when it was no longer possible to receive because it was clearly understood as absurd. <laughs> the word could not be made flesh until man had reached the state of absolute contradiction between clarity and despair, in which they would have no choice but either to accept absolutely or to reject absolutely. Yet, in their choice, there should be no element of luck for they would be fully conscious of what they were accepting or rejecting. Chorus, the eternal spaces were congested and depraved. Simeon, but here and now the word, which is implicit in the beginning, and in the end is become immediately explicit. And that which hitherto we could only passively fear as the incomprehensible I am. Henceforth, we may actively love with comprehension that thou art. Wherefore, mm. having seen him, not in some prophetic vision of what might be, but with the eyes of our own weakness, as to what actually is. We are bold to say that we have seen our salvation. One more brief passage, chorus. 
now and forever. We are not alone. Simeon, by the event of this birth and the true significance of all other events is defined. For every other occasion, it can be said that it could have been different. But of this birth, it is the case that it could in no way be other than it is. And by the existence of this child, the proper value of all other existence is given. For of every other creature, it can be said that it has extrinsic importance. But of this child, it is the case that he is in no sense a symbol. Mm. Well, the profundity of the Christmas oratorio, I'm about to ruin, but thank you, David. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, <clears throat> it does, um, there was something that Andrew had said about the truth is always known only through the incarnation. Did I get that right, Andrew? That you had said that it wasn't something you had read. It was um, because you were speaking to knowledge being found in the uh cataphatic as well as the oh yeah no just and, and the, yeah yeah that 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 the cataphatic and the apophatic complement each other and right. maximus says that the the beauty and magnificence of creation gives us everything we need from right. cataphatic and and so that is equally authoritative in its own way as right. apophatic as the, the approach right. that says there's no trace we cannot see yeah, yeah. right so yeah i thought you had drawn on the incarnation itself which which i wanted to ask oh no because yeah and we oh, learn of both yeah. of those through the the transfiguration which is the fullness right. of our incarnate lord right pardon me it's, right, right. It's, yeah, okay that's the got it okay maximus i missed that one is, line okay yeah, got maximus it. his point he keeps figuring things through the yes. transfiguration transfiguration okay i missed that one Pardon, you're connecting yeah, that. Okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> I wondered about that when you talked about it, Andrew, as well. <laughs> so let me just raise one thing about that little passage. David, I'm very <laughs> sorry. Could, David, go, pardon me. Could you repeat that line? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. You wondered about what? about uh, what you had to say around these two modes right at the beginning. Oh, pardon me, pardon me. The simple apophatic and the composite. <laughs> and you talked about them as emphasis. Mm -hmm. One is not better than the other. No. But my sense is that you don't have one without the other. That no, is no. that both are necessary. Yeah, they complement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so it's, it, not about, it. it's not about whether these are two different traditions going to the same place. No, no, no. It's no, that no. they are necessary to each other. They're necessary to the fulfillment of each other. Mm -hmm. They're necessary to what each of them is calling us towards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that I mean. 
you in in a lecture some 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 time ago david go you you were musing about those who believe or those who state that prayer can be <coughs> a leaving behind of the material world and you said where do you think you are when you pray where i mean where do you think you are where and when to use maximus's terms apophasis that's that's the danger of the complete denial the idea that it is a complete because it kind of makes it sound like are you going to choose <coughs> the path of beauty and magnificence or are you going to choose the path that says that's all illusion that's all unreal but like you say david they they, they complement each other and i think that the, the 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 next line in the in the in the in the poem the, the chorus line if you saw the book open tell us i, I close it but it's the chorus says something like we must we, we must believe that we are real or we do believe that we are real or, or or something like that but it's it's the chorus it's the human voice saying i am real immediately after the character of simeon who is blessed bless the infant christ has said yeah. that this infant is in no way a symbol. And this to me shows that the greatness of Maximus's recasting of the idea of symbol, where it no longer means representation, something that's removed from reality. Just like humanity in the tradition is not, it's not, there's not divine reality and human illusion, right? Gnosticism, despite its tenacious presence, is silly in the face of what the incarnate logos proclaims it doesn't make any sense and i mean jennings you re you responded to this earlier uh kind of um um uh with energy the idea that that what do you mean there's no there's no presence there's no what i mean because it is on that level of instinct it doesn't make sense to say that this world is not blessed to say that our language mimics reality, to say that reality is deferred. This is the disease of the mind. This, this is why the 20th century should have read Maximus. But can Maximus I, uh, renews our way of symbol. Pardon me, Ahmed, please go on. Can I provoke in the spirit of uh, Michael, who's not here? Can I maybe just yeah. provoke, the provoke a little? Um, shouldn't Okay, so David Goa, this idea of the, the relationship between, and to, to, to reference uh, Andrew's, uh, the lecture that you had, you had given in years past, the relationship between prayer and where we are, um, yes, both are essential and both are, you know, the, the, in, a, in, a, in a dynamic with one another. Given our, Maximus is writing in seventh century, sixth century, seventh century, correct? As we read now in the 21st century, shouldn't perhaps the balance be a little bit, uh, a little bit more firmly on the prayer? Because, and I'll, and I'll, the prayer or, or the mystery, and I'll, and I'll say, and I'll, and I'll explain why, because I believe that there is a temptation that historically just human beings have yielded to in general towards a kind of virtuosity, a temptation towards virtuosity in, in language, in, 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 in the virtuosity of knowledge, really, whether it's in language or understanding the natural world or even in the arts. So in fact, In, in music, for example, so I, I you know, I, I listen to, uh, I'm a big fan of classical music. And when I first started listening to classical music, I started where most people start, which is in the classical period. Mozart, Beethoven, and all this stuff was great and excellent and profound. And then slowly, as my, uh, as my ear became sharper and more attuned, I realized I had to move backwards in time. And then I listened to Bach. And then I listened to pre-Baroque and I listened to Palestrina and Monteverdi and I and I and I started to notice that 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 what they did or 
their, the, the, the power of their music did not reside in the virtuosity of the form. And the virtuosity of the form in, in classical music, in the later, in someone like Mozart, I mean, he is synonymous with a kind of this brilliance and virtuosity. And, but as you move backwards in time, it's as though the power of their knowledge was in attempting to know simply, still to know simply, going backwards, to know simply. And now I'm listening to pieces from the 12th and 13th centuries where the polyphony is so basic and, and so quote unquote primitive. And yet, as I listen to it more and more, I realize that that polyphony has, is, is it knows simply, it knows simply in the same way. And, and as I was thinking this, I thought about something that you had said to Andrew again in years past and in a dialogue that you had with him, recalling your father as a carpenter who knows his wood and knows it simply. And that knowledge is, there's a fullness about that knowledge. There's a fullness about that knowledge. And it's not antithetical to virtuosity or it, it, it's not against the spirit of, of, of knowing through sensory perception, but it, requires again requires an engagement with with the mystery and so just to come back to the original provocation which is when i'm sitting when i'm here with you guys and everyone is speaking I feel most present and, and I feel when we are actually in a state of prayer, what we say is in a st we're almost in a state of prayer. We're no longer really making arguments or talking again, rhetorically. We are simply in a, in a state of prayer together. Okay, I'm gonna. It's 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 becoming. Sorry, I'm gonna stop now because I, 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 I uh, yeah. Apologies for the. Rant. It started as a provocation and then descended into a strange. No, 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 don't no. don't you dare apologize for that. <clears throat> so can I just ask Ahmed? I mean, you started with a, a provocation, and I'm not quite sure I understood it. Was that that in that prayer ought to move uh, because we're talking about the cataphatic and, and ataphatic type of modes of theology. And I think you were saying we have to move more to the, was it the ataphatic that, that you're saying that, yeah. that in, in the 21st century, perhaps, perhaps, in, perhaps in the seventh century, there was this balance that existed but it, whatever that balance was in the 21st century, there's a different balance given all of the pressures and the ways that we examine things. And this virtuosity of thinking and everything else builds up the cataphatic an awful yeah. lot. And so we need more of the ataphatic. Is that what you're getting at? That's a good, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a fine way. Of, yeah, that's a, thank you. That clarifies. Not as beautiful as what you said, but it, okay. Okay. At least it clarifies. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Hmm. Let me, uh, pr pardon me, Ahmed. No, no, pardon. please. Go, go okay. Ahead. Let me, David, do you mind if I set, set you up for a story or two? Go. Uh, let me. Um, Usually I have to pour a scotch to get him to tell a no, story or no, two. No, but... no, 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 it'll be all right. It'll be all right. <laughs> let me, um, I'll tell one because I like the, the dirty language, but the other one David needs to tell. It's. Robin Matthews once said that the danger of abandoning a tradition which has become ossified is only equaled by, or the danger of staying with a tradition that has become ossified is only equaled by the danger of leaving it behind. A while ago, around 2000, I remember a casual conversation with David Goa. We didn't know each other that well then. And he said, uh, I think the 21st century, 21st century, whatever in the new century will be 
the the century of biology and i thought biology physics doesn't make sense back to the but he's been proved right that biology has been the major debate in the first 20 years of this right <clears throat> The person, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of reflecting off your, 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 your comments on that. So it's not really at you. It's more alongside. What do we emphasize? What do we emphasize? Ivan Ilyich, in uh, this is the the story David is told, talking about his own tradition. What to do when something becomes problematic, right? Do you admit that you're a son of a bitch? Or do you become a motherfucker and disrupt? Well, purity and impurity then become questions which are, which are hard to discern, right? And then David, there's that great story of, of Buber and his visitor and the word God and the abuse of that word and how, I, I don't know if you want to tell it here, um, but it was, it was a question of, when to how often do we bring up what's most problematic for us the body and prayer the body seems the most fraught area right now for us but it may be the most important thing this communion we're experiencing as you say Ahmed, in this state is despite our, our lack of physical presence we have to cope with something the body is a troubled site right now it would be, it would feel different if we were in the same room. Not better, not, I'm not saying that. It would be a fullness though. What do we do when something becomes problematic? Do we leave it? Do we try to renew it? What do we do? And, and Bubba, I, I don't know if, 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 it, if, it, if, it, if it's, if it matters, Maybe 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 this story would be good to hear, David, but it might not matter. But what is the story about, about Buber's visitor and, and the word God? Do, do you remember the, the, you told it to me more than once. I'm sorry, I, you, you, perhaps you're muted. Um. It's, it's in his little book called Meetings, and he goes to, he's invited by a theological faculty to a university town in Germany because the Christian theological faculties were more interested in it than Jews were. So, uh, <clears throat> and he stays with uh, an old man, as he calls him who he shared an interest because the old man was very well known. He had written a lot. And he also was uh, a person that had uh, been involved in, in the teaching of the young. And Buber, of course, had his lair house where he was teaching people in an ongoing way. And, um, when they were there boober boober stayed at his house overnight <laughs> and the man offered him his study if he needed it in, in the morning boober received the um the proofs of a book that he had just uh written and he wanted to read it carefully because he says it was the closest thing he'd ever written to a kind of statement of belief i guess <laughs> so he went down to the study to read it to read the introduction and uh, the old man was sitting there and it was uh, still dark and he asked him what he had in his hand so he told him and so the old man um, said, well, why don't you read it to me? And 
I don't think I can do this justice, Andrew, but I could go and get it and read it. I mean, it just takes five minutes. And do so. Okay, do so. just excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> The final. I used to know when actually everything was located, of course, but <laughs> no, I no longer do. Well, I'll do it. I'll 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 be the uh, the little entertainment for the the opening act, as the opening act. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this. I was just reading, and I think this is to point. But I don't know if you heard about this Canadian retailer Simons, who had not Simeon Simons. Uh, who just released a video to sell clothes called All is Beauty. And I'll just read you a summary of it. Features Jennifer, a terminally ill woman who in October this year opted for Canada's new widespread euthanasia program. And gets some details. Uh, but apparently it needs promotion. The video feels like an advert for this way of ending your life. It's styled in heavily boho consumerist terms, compiling the kind of footage, oceans, bubble blowing, convivial mealtimes, glowing lanterns, lanterns you'd expect in bourgeois holiday uh, rental ads. These, however, are combined with an audio voiceover from interviews with Jennifer herself. She was, in fact, a real person in which she talks about seeing beauty in everything, even as she plans to end her own life. This is the dystopia that Ahmed's talking about, I think, of where our where we try to figure out the balance of of you know with with where we are with biology, how much mystery we need to bring to this when we speak of beauty, but it's got no relation to truth or goodness as far as I can see, and you know it's seen as a good way as the person writing about this wrote that it's uh, it's a good way to sell a Vivian Westwood tweed bomber jacket. You know, where's our culture at? And she writes actually, you know, um, you know, it's the taboo smashing uh, racket, uh, <coughs> ratchet goes on um, that, that the prohibit prohibitions that uphold our humanist settlement even if it's the ending of your own life. It's at least a century too late though, to wonder how many of other taboos whose smoking rubble we now call culture, we also, we're also standing between us and profound darkness. But yeah, you know. This... If we're only a century behind in these people's minds, then uh, we might Well, not she was referenced, yeah, yeah. She was referencing a Coco Chanel ad a hundred years ago to try to smash <clears throat> taboos. So, but. But you know, there this you is go. the this is the uh, uh, I think um, uh, this is getting to some of the questions you're saying about the 21st century and the issue of biology, where of what we're contemplating, and if prayer is to not address so much as be um, a response, maybe. Uh, to that, that it needs to be a little more over here than it was maybe in the seventh century, where there mm -hmm. would have been a humility about all this stuff. That is some depressing, depressing stuff what you just read. That Isn't is it? depressing. That yeah. is depressing. Uh, yeah. It's so far from beauty. It's it's an, it's just so antithetical to to. to <laughs> Von, von Balthasar writes about how most of what, you know, while he loves writing about beauty, he says virtually everything is ugly these days. And, you know, an ad, um, you know, I can, I can actually 
flip you. Uh, let me just do the screen share just for a second here. Oh, it's disabled. Um, it's a, you know, it's an ad of her sitting at the ocean, looking out at the ocean as the, uh, you know, the sun setting and everything else. Just beautiful. But we're going to. Let's uh, let, let's let's move on to the to the yeah, reading yeah, from yeah, the ads. Move on to Otherwise, David. we'll, we'll yeah. seriously feel yeah. like self harming. <laughs> but just yeah. briefly, in the in the in the mention of of Balthazar, Oh Hazar Balthazar is a film by Bresson, who's the greatest. Oh yeah, filmmaker. Ahmed, what you were saying earlier about the temptation towards virtuosity, <laughs> I think that I, I, that is perfectly phrased. That is the temptation now, right? And Bresson talks about it in, in his book on um, uh, no, uh, cinematography, notes on cinematography, when he says the virtuoso only knows one way, right? But the best knowing is pressing the appropriate notes, hitting the appropriate notes at the appropriate time, which is the rhythm. Bresson is filmmaker we're talking about music and film Brisson's films are are profoundly of the spirit that we're talking about in all of yeah. this stuff but pardon me david pardon me so i'll just begin uh where i left off my description <clears throat> so this is martin buber in uh he thinks uh, a book that's not all that well known but charming is that your twin brother david yeah. That yeah. picture on the front. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uncanny. They, this has been, uh, I, I take it as a compliment. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's the contents that will make him more like a brother than even the cover. <laughs> One morning I got up in order to read proofs. The evening before I had received galley proofs of the preface of a book of mine. And since this preface was a statement of faith, I wish to read it once again quite carefully before it was printed. Now I took it into the study below that had been offered to me in case I should need it. But here the old man already sat in his writing desk, at his writing desk. Directly after greeting me, he asked me what I had in my hand. And when I told him, he asked whether I would not read it aloud to him. I did so gladly. He listened in a friendly manner, but clearly astonished, indeed with growing amazement. When I was through, he spoke hesitatingly, then carried away by the importance of his subject even more passionately. How can you bring yourself to use God time after time? How can you expect that your readers will take the word in the sense in which you wish it to be taken? What you mean by the name of God is something above all human grasp and comprehension. But in speaking about it, you have lowered it to a human conceptualization. What word of human speech is so misused, so defiled, so desecrated as this? All the innocent blood that has been shed for it has robbed it of its radiance. All the injustice that it has been used to cover has effaced its features. Hmm. When I hear the highest called God, it sometimes seems almost blasphemous. The kindly eyes flamed. The voice itself flared. Then we sat silent for a while, facing each other. <clears throat> the room lay in the flowing brightness of early morning. It seemed to me as if a power from the light entered into me. What I now answer, I cannot, what I now answered, I cannot today reproduce, but only indicate. Yes, I said. It is the most heavy laden of all human words. None has become so soiled, so mutilated. Just for that reason, I may not abandon it. 
generations of men have laid the burden of their anxiety, their anxious lives upon this word and weighed it <clears throat> to the ground. Oh, sorry. Wow. I'm sorry. You hear me now? Yeah. Generations of men have laid the burden of their anxious lives upon this word and weighed it to the ground. It lies in the dust and bears their whole burden. The races of man with their religious factions have torn the word to pieces. They have killed for it and died for it. And it bears their finger marks and their blood. Where might I find a word like it to describe the highest? If I took the purest, most sparkling concept from the inner treasure chamber of the philosophers, I could only capture thereby an unbinding product of thought. I could not capture the presence of him whom the generations of men have honored and degraded with their awesome living and dying. I do indeed mean him whom the hell tormented and the heaven storming generations of men mean. Certainly they draw caricatures and write God underneath. They murder one another and say in God's name, but when all madness and delusion fall to dust, when they stand over against him in the loneliest darkness and no longer say he, he, but rather sigh, thou, shout thou, all of them the one word. And when they then add God, it is not the real God. Is it not the real God whom they all implore? The one living God, the God of the children of man. Is it not he who hears them? And just for this reason, is not the word God, the word of appeal? The word which has become a name, consecrated in all human tongues for all time. We must esteem those who interdict it because they rebel against the injustice and wrong which are so readily referred to God for authorization. But we may not give it up. How understandable it is that some suggest we should remain silent about the last thing for a time in order that the misused word may be redeemed. But they are not to be redeemed thus. We cannot cleanse the word God and we cannot make it whole. But defiled and mutilated as it is, we can raise it from the ground and set it over an hour of great care. It had become very light in the room. It was no longer dawning, <clears throat> it was light. The old man stood up came over to me, laid his hand on my shoulder and spoke. Let us be friends. The conversation was completed for where two or three are truly together. They are together in the name of God. So the wounded and mutilated words.
It's healing, not discarding. You know, David, as I was listening to you, I thought to myself, this is kind of the, this is a predicament and privilege of all the Abrahamic children, <coughs> Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, those who have uh, adopted, a, not adopted, but who, who, who have a monotheistic and monotheism, I know in Christianity, that's, <laughs> Do you guys consider yourselves a monotheistic religion? Can I, can I still? Yeah. Okay. Is that God, you know, if you think about all the ancient religions, the religions of the ancient world, they, they might have resolved this, this dilemma that's described by, by the anecdote you just, you, you just uh, recalled by actually putting in a lot of gods. A multiplicity, almost a pantheism. Most ancient religions are pantheistic. And perhaps that's a way of getting around, getting around the issue of needing to put the Godhead front and center where it can be soiled, where it can be dragged down, where it can be demeaned. And perhaps the ancient way is a, is a way of, again, returning to or trying to keep it diffuse, mysterious, keep the Godhead diffuse and, and, and a mystery. And this goes back to the, to the I feel like, the, the theme of mystery that I, I, I just, I think it's central to Maxim's idea of, and, and one of the two modes of theology, that which is approached through absolute silence. <laughs> Um, I feel like perhaps we need to invest back into, we have divested from mystery uh, and a lot of, uh, from my lapse tradition, we have certainly divested in some ways from the mystery, from, from, from the, the unknowability of God. And in general, I think there's been a movement towards this divestment from the mystery. The ancient world knew it, I think. And I think maybe the early Christians and knew it as well. I think Maximus is, is certainly knows it. Um, and Buber and that anecdote certainly intimates it as well so that goes back to putting the emphasis more on prayer <laughs> maybe that it's, it's that idea of <laughs> yeah be wary though of, histor of historical determination there be wary of history uh, of, of thinking of history in terms of necessity <laughs> something's not generally past or generally present mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in general. Uh, yes, Andrew, I, I, I agree with you 100%. In, in terms of my own tradition, the, the, the one I'm last from is there's a, a tendency towards literalism, you know, theological literalism. Again, a, a divestment from the mystery. It's an expression of divesting from what is from that if essential we, mystery. Yeah. If, if to, to uh, the, the Buber story, David, thank you for reading, is such a profound and moving, and Buber writes well, and he, he thinks so beautifully. If, if Ahmed, and I, I love how you keep returning to, to this, this, the centrality of, of mystery, because it's true. It, it is. That is, but not for Maximus, for the tradition. I mean, for Maximus, but not, it's not his, it's not unique to him. He's partaking of this. And David, might it be fair, David Gould, might it be fair to say in that story that, that, that Buber is kind of realigning the sense of, of what it means to name God. If we think of it in terms that Maximus introduces, and, and, and I think it, it's warranted, 
that na to name something is to call unto its mystery, to call un to call unto the drawing forth of its mystery. Then the, the word God and and I think Ahmed that might that might that might uh, uh, <laughs> pardon me that might chime with uh, if you're ready to chime that might chime with uh, with what you just said. But also resonate. then uh, resonate yeah chime is earlier historically but, <laughs> but also it, it 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 kind of echoes what buber was resisting which was the idea that a naming is supposed to define or nail down or be certain or or kind of render still life you know it seemed to me like the fear of, of buber's colleague is that we're deadening we're deadening we're we're making an idol and by naming God and Buber says, but that's not, that doesn't have to be what naming is. Naming is calling. We call. Prayer his is line. calling. Pardon me. That is line that um, this is a word that stands over an hour of great care. That's how he put it. In other words, it's a presence that is there when there is great care mm. and that great care uh, mm. has all the mess in it mm. has all the mess in it but just because there's all the mess there doesn't mean there can't be the hour of great care <laughs> and so it seems to me he's you know as he does so often he's saying uh, that's that's where the attention needs to be. You can't purify. It's a lovely idea, but it can't be done. Because we are creatures. But we can care. We can be present. Even if it includes all that stuff. And through that, Let's be friends. That's the shift that can take place. Yeah. That's beautiful. And in those moments, we complete the truth of the transfiguration in our own lives. We partake of, of what Christ reveals and gives us. We see the figure of the broken world instead of react from within it. But the description of mystery does not just speak to the ineffable nature of the Godhead. I think the other thing that the mystery offers is a posture of humility, especially, you know, to get to Ahmed's point about the 21st century, where there are so many virtuosos. Humility um, maybe is a, 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 um, a less common starting point for a lot of us when we're dealing with God. So, Mystery is saying, you know, is an acknowledgement that I don't know, I won't know. You know, it's not a problem to be solved, it's to be entered into. And, um, and I won't control this. That's what I, I, I like about that call to mystery. Um, and David, everything you just said there echoes out of that passage you read earlier. Everything you just said there. If we take it existentially, like Goa led us into considering it, not in terms of facts about God, but in terms of how it prepares us to consider. Yeah. yeah. And that humility you talked about. I was, I mean, this line, it came up, Ahmed, you read it, and Goa, you commented on it and, and complimented with Autumn, but the fact that God exists, but not but not what he is. 
and something in what was read, I think, I think in Auden's text, uh, David, um, the language was thou art, that thou art, perhaps it was. Oh, go from the I am to the thou art. Yeah, Yeah, that was beautiful. And in, in, this is just maybe a nice little, nice little story to, to end anecdote, what have you. Dostoevsky, his, his, and thou art says, thou art, but, but thou art the mystery. It's not comprehension. It's, it's, it's a blessing and an openness and, and, and a receivedness. Dostoevsky, he said, thou art is the affirmation of the human soul. And his character Stavrogan in Demons, in the novel Demons are the Devils. Stavrogan's being says, thou art not. And thou art not is the ultimate or the essentially nihilistic uh, stance. Thou art not. The denial of, of the divine and the thou art of the divine according to Dostoevsky. So that just, I, I, I mean, what one could elaborate at length, but, but that, that, that came to mind. And I like it because Dostoevsky saw it in, in th- these distinctive terms. And Jennings, to go back to, to your earlier query, thou art is fully affirmative, fully yeah. embracing. It, it's all there. So we know Theology is not about removing creation. We know that. So Apophasis is doing something else. But thou art and thou art not is, well, it's, it's five words that yeah. change life. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Perhaps we, perhaps we, uh, Perhaps you say good night. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much.